Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by my friend Gary Astridge, who is the curator, historian, and lecturer on lecturer on everything Ringo. Gary, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Bart. Yes. So um, I'll say up front that um, we're talking about the amazing Get Back Beatles documentary, which is just uh, unbelievable. I mean, it's for for Beatles guys like us and and especially like you, who's who's the king of the <laughs> Beatles history. Um, it is just so cool. You get a glimpse into their life. And um, we this is coming out a little bit after the initial boom of the the documentary coming out. But we had some scheduling stuff and then the holidays and it just happened. So I think it's better better late than never. And um, we have some questions from um, people on social media. We have a ton of them, so we'll hit as many as we can. <laughs> but um, yeah, Gary, so why don't we just start off with um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about maybe for people who don't know what Get Back is and then your reactions to this. And you know, I'm sure you knew about it kind of earlier than uh, the rest of us folks. Um, but yeah, so tell us about Get Back just in general. Uh with Get Back, you know, from what I understand is that um, the Beatles wanted to make an album and John was a little insistent of saying, hey, you know, let's just go back to our our origins at the beginning. You know, like, let's just do a record. What comes out, comes out. We're not going to overdub. We're not going to add things. You know, we're just, we just want to do it basically live. And um, uh, that was the premise. And, and at the same time, you know, he, the Beatles understandably were going through some turmoil and, yeah. uh, um, you know, there was what 50 plus, um, close to 60 hours of, uh, uh, film. And, uh, uh, so, so when let it be came out, you know, it's, it's kind of depressing, you know, it, and, and being older, living through it, it was, um, you know, you, you try to be positive, or I remember I, I was because you're hearing all these new songs, and uh, it's, and you're watching them, you know, perform them, and uh, and what I like about the documentary is uh, um, you get to see the magic, you know, and and it's yeah. just and it's so rudimentary, you know. I mean, it's funny we're we're, I mean, they're not talking about uh, um, notes and 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 details it's just like hey let's move this bit you know and which seemed to be a common word and the the only thing that that really made it would make it uh extra special is now with decades of uh that have gone by we know the songs but it would have been cool to see it then if you never heard the album never heard a song and then you're watching paul mccartney create get back I mean that would have been you know mind blowing for uh, to 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 be in that that mindset. But, yeah. Um, uh, well, that's. I mean, let me poke in with some you know pop in with some questions here. So why did it not get released? Um, why was all that footage not used? And and I mean, I love the Beatles, and I I try to watch everything and and listen to everything. But there was a film that came out. Um, earlier on correct that that was using some of that footage but it wasn't a yeah, just let it be the movie right yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. which which um i you know it's it's crazy that i i've again i love the beatles i don't think i ever watched let it be the movie uh somehow which is miraculous maybe it's just because it's not as easily to you know these all these films aren't all in one place where you can just go and pop them yeah. on um so how, yeah it is i i gotta say too that i had mixed feelings watching it of like it's so cool to see it. I loved that they were being like silly and that they were, um, you know, you got to see the real people. You got to see John being John and the, the, all that kind of funny stuff. But also, man, it really made you kind of feel, um, I felt kind of sad at points and weird, I guess, a little bit that to see how it was happening with John. And, um, I know everyone has different feelings about Yoko, but it was just a bizarre, uh, relationship going on with the band and then George leaves and it really was kind of a, at some points it was, I mean, it was a good, it was a roller coaster, but it was kind of a bummer at points to see some of the things that happened. Yeah. yeah. I, I had a very good friend that uh, couldn't even get through the first uh, uh, segment. 
He just said, yeah. it was just so depressing. And, then, and he said to me, he goes, and Ringo just constantly looks so bored, you know? <laughs> and, and it's like, yeah, I go, but, you know, I go, at certain points, I go, you can still look at what's going on in the background. You can see gear. And it's like, what is that doing there? I, I never knew that they're, you know, that they brought that into the, uh, you know, to twicking him and things. But, yeah. but you're right. And, and George kind of just, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't knew, if you didn't know it was coming, I mean, he was just like blindsided everybody with like, yeah, I'm leaving. You know, it's like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I, I see the um, the difficulty of like how hard it is for like, let's call him what it is. I mean, a creative genius. George is obviously like all of them are creative geniuses. How hard it is to bring his songs to the table to get heard by Lennon and McCartney. I mean, he was about at his breaking point obviously and 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 then that that when they go off into the um uh the cafeteria and there's like a hidden microphone in a flower mm -hmm. pot or whatever and, and uh um paul and john are talking about you you know you i think paul was like you're the leader of the band we all know you're the leader of the band but really you get the feeling that paul was leading this and he was the only one who i don't want to say cared anymore but was pushing it forward to get this done it just again i you you feel weird at seeing that that intimate but but it also made them to me feel very uh like a real band not like this mythical thing it was it was very much like these guys are just a four-piece band who have the same troubles we all do with our friends in i'm in cincinnati you're in buffalo we'd, we'd hit the same stuff with a bar band that we might be playing in where you know, you're butting heads and stuff. It, it's, it's just interesting. Yeah. And it's funny when you, when you think about, you know, I mean, they have a lot of history and, and you, you see that they're just, they're just normal people. You know, you, you really see the different personalities and, and I don't know about you, but you know, I grew up with a lot of um, guys, my age, you know, from, from being small, going through school together. And even though we're all dear friends, you know, when I look back on it, there was some of them that I just kind of tolerated, you know, because I just didn't like their personalities. There were some, it was like, man, I, I you know, I, I just loved being with them. You know, we had the same sense of humor, you know. So, so in the Beatles, I think there was that, you know, and, and, and you can tell, you know, that uh, they were all extremely gifted in, in their own ways. And uh, Paul, I mean, was off the charts. You know, you can't deny that. And, um, uh, you know, he was on, you know, 24 hours a day, just music. And, and, and I guess once Brian Epstein passed away in 67, August of 67, you know, he just seemingly picked up the ball instead of the band looking at that time for, uh, a manager, you know, they yeah. just kind of just roamed on their own and Paul just took over that leadership. And I, and I think, you know, it's obvious, you know, George just resented it, you know, yeah. just, this guy's always telling me what to do and, uh, you know. But and, and John, I, I guess it's a hard one to figure out with him because they say he was on heroin at the time, you know, so. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, you know, so I'm thinking like, so what's his real personality? You know, is he high now or is he normal? You know, so. Um, hmm. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't know. You hear these stories about John and he, he does have a rough edge to him. I was just watching the Harry Nielsen um, documentary on um, hmm. Amazon, which was really good. But there were stories about. Harry Nielsen and um, John with a lot of cocaine and just going hard and, and him being, I mean, he, he has a, he's got a bit of a rough uh, part to his personality that will, will push back and will fight. Oh, yeah. um, that's interesting too. Cause I mean, and, and then like you said with, with Paul um, it, I feel for Paul of everyone, of course, everyone watches it and goes, God, this guy's like, controlling the band and what a bossy guy and but then you think no one else was really taking that role of leading it and you know he was sitting there kind of going all right we're gotta get this going we need to get this done let's move on to the next one there was so much history and uh just i don't know so much background to him that that you kind of like it's like a marriage where you know you can't always move past the um, the problems and it's almost like the well you're loading the dishwasher wrong and you're making me mad by doing that or <laughs> you're yeah. squeezing the toothpaste wrong as as people say <laughs> and and it's bugging me and now I'm gonna I can't stand it anymore like it's it's the little things um which I get it everyone in life has those those feelings but it's it, it's definitely interesting to see it as a fly on the wall 
and you, and what else is interesting when you when you think about it, they had such a unique situation, you know, where when they were, uh, you know, and, and when when they really broke, you know, into the U.S. and their their fame was just um, undescribable, you know, and and just and and they constantly would say, he goes, we're just we'd be together all the time, you know, we'd be in the same, you know, that even with uh, traveling, you know, it'd be like two hotel rooms, they, you know, each would double up with uh, one of the others, so. Yeah. You know, you have to reach a point where it's like, ah, I need some fresh air. I, you know, I, I can't take it. You know, but it, yeah. it's just human nature. Yeah. And, and and as fans, we all we nobody wanted to hear or see that. No, no. especially what you're saying with um with George, because I think Ringo, and we'll talk about Ringo here in a second, because obviously this is a drum podcast, and we all love Ringo. Uh, but. George very much, you could tell it was like, I want to go off on my own. And he would be, you know, pitching some songs and and it would just be like, okay, let's move on to another one that a Lennon McCartney song. And then, of course, he would use that later on his own solo stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. But so Ringo, I think everyone I mean, he is just we all know this, but he's hysterical. And the he he in in the best way possible is, is the comic, you know, the comedic relief in in a lot of senses where he kind of breaks uh breaks up that tension yeah, very neutralizing yeah yeah but he is just sitting there a lot which which you know not not and again in a way of like ringo's um i mean what else was he going to be doing but he he had a good good attitude he didn't seem to get bored um i don't know what what is i'm sure you've probably spoken to him um what is Ringo's reaction to all this? You know, the release of it. I'm sure he's happy. He's a happy guy, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he's a happy guy. I, I, from what I, 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 he didn't tell me this, but what I was told, I was told when, when he, uh, sat through the rough cut, you know, um, you know, I, it was hours and hours. And he, I, one of his comments was, who's going to want to watch this? Yeah. You know, there's a lot, a lot of, a lot of people. Yeah. But, um, but when you piece together a lot of things that he has said over time, you know, um, one was that uh, um, he, he always felt that his job was to be ready. You know, so even though he looked bored or sitting there, you know, he's he's watching things being created. And it's it, it's um, it's obvious, you know, that, that there was times where Paul would give Ringo instructions to say, this is what I'm hearing in my head. Mm-hmm. And then Ringo would take that thought and, and make it his own. Yep. And um, uh, it's interesting. If you go way back, um, you, you can find a, a recording in the um, uh, at EMI when they were doing I Want to Hold Your Hand. And, and in one of the, at the beginning of one of the tracks, they start and they stop. And then Paul yells out, he goes, Ringo, you know, and he goes, attack. He goes, the first bit was attack, you know, so, so he's, 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 he's doing it then, you know, and, and he's, and, and, uh, uh, you know, so that was that, but, but there was the yeah. other thing too, where, where Ringo had mentioned that, you know, said there was a point where you hang around with John a lot and then they'd be together and the phone would ring and they would, they would say, it's Paul, he's going to want us to go to work. You know, and they and they were just happy doing nothing. You know, so yeah. Um, but it's yeah, I mean, surprise. that's that that thing you're we're saying though of like you you of course you uh you look at Paul as like the taskmaster, but that since Brian Epstein passed away and they lost that father figure, as they kind of said in it, where where you the you know daddy's not here anymore or whatever he said. Um, you need to have that. And I, I feel like Ringo understood that from what I could tell of like, you know, he, he, he had no, I don't think he had any ill will towards anyone in the band yeah. where you could definitely see that John and Paul, Paul and the other Beatles were butting heads, um, obviously. But so why don't we talk some drum stuff here? I mean, it was, I mean, Ringo seemed to pick, he's, he's, we all know it. We've all, we've all, you know, Ringo fans have always known it, that he is a phenomenal drummer. he, has unbelievable sounds, but God, the, the tone, the, um, his playing, his ability to pick things up quickly. It's just great. Why don't you just, what, what are your thoughts after seeing that? I mean, obviously you've seen Ringo play a bunch in person and things like that, but, but from seeing that in that period of time, what, how did you walk away feeling about Ringo and his style and his playing? Um, I, well, a it put a smile on my face, you know, because, um, 
as a drummer, you know, many of us, um, I, I, I always just always say that you, you can't, you can't, um, uh, you can't nail Ringo. I mean, you can emulate him, but mm-hmm. his style is like so unique and the feel is so, um, so unique to him. You know, you, you, you can uh, kind of come close, but you can never nail it. And, and, and I never, and I've heard some very, very good drummers, you know, and I've never really heard someone that, that captures that essence. But, it's, but it was just interesting just to see how he, you know, plays, um, you know, how it's just rudimentary. <clears throat> you know, some people were questioning uh, because of the, um, because of Ringo's choice where he had the key towel on the snare drum. And with some songs uh, like For You Blue that had brushes, you know, that uh, some people's takes was, oh, look at that. Ringo plays with brushes and he uses a towel just to keep his the, the sound of the drums down so he's not dominating uh, the, the process. Mm-hmm. And we're like, yeah, you know, I, I don't, that's not how I'm looking at it. You know, I just I just thought he was using whatever is appropriate, and then he just liked that 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 muffled sound. But but it was yeah. interesting. Um, you know, even with his drum setup, that's always a big question. It's like, why would he have the two uh, uh, toms on a a, a a tom mount stand? You know, it's just so far away. But um, uh, Ringo doesn't remember the reason. And from what from what I can see is when he first got that kit in September of '68, um, there's pictures out now that you can see where it shows Ringo uh, and Paul um, sitting behind a combination of Ringo, one of Ringo's Oyster Black Pearl kits and the Maple kit, and they were trying to get him to do double toms and or, or double you know uh, kick drums, and uh, Ringo tried it, didn't like it, and that was on Glass Onion, uh, where, where that it just so happened they were working on that song. Hmm. Uh, I think it was September 11th, 68, when, when his, when this drum kit was delivered. So he tried it and there was no tracks were kept, you know, so that just got tossed, but, but Ringo just kept using the stand. And ironically enough, um, the way Ringo sat behind his kit, you know, he, he's small in stature and, um, he sat high behind the kit and he, and, and he sat close. He was, he was really, really close. So when, when you actually set up, his drum kit, you know, or, or a drum kit like that, um, the way he used it on Let It Be, yeah. it works. It's it's not, you know, like the, the 13 by 9 Tom, it's not that far away. I mean, every, everything everything works. So, yeah. um, but but you, but you just have to, you know, I, I guess just think it through, but. Um, yeah. No, that's interesting because that, that uh, it, it, you know, he's got that unique style, but it, it makes sense that he's very close up on it because I noticed that. And that was actually when we'll get to some questions later, people were asking about his Tom choice and, and, you know, and that, that stand and all that and his symbols, it's, it's different than his usual classic, you know, the, the, what everyone thinks of with his original Ludwig kit. Yeah. But, um, why don't you maybe describe sizes, color? Cause again, if, if everyone hasn't, you know, seen it, maybe they can listen to this and then go watch eight hours or whatever it is of, uh, of get back. But so describe his drums, even down to the sticker on the toms. I mean, like give us kind of the rundown of what he was okay. using. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, the drum kit was, uh, it was like a Hollywood kit uh, or Hollywood model drum kit. So when he, when he got it, he came with a, uh, a five by 14 superphonic snare drum. And, uh, uh, the toms were, uh, you know, uh, uh, eight by 12, nine by 13 and 16 by 16 floor tom, 22 by 14, uh, a bass, you know, he had the regular speed King, uh, pedal, you know, the, and then he kept using like the, uh, was it model 1123 hi-hat stand, mm-hmm. you know, and the 1400, um, model, uh, cymbal stands. And then his, uh, uh, the drum kit came with calfskin heads. Oh, and, wow. And obviously when you watch the video, he's, he's got this like the uh, Ludwig Weathermaster. Yeah. So um, hmm. he thought that since they um, knew they were going to be performing at Wickingham Studios and with um, the, the temperature changes and things that they swapped it out and put on some 
uh, obviously used heads or, or, or new heads that, that were getting get dirty rather quickly. But yeah, sure. Um, uh, but, you know, but that's what he did. And as far as symbols, um, uh, that's always been a big question, you know. So what we're able to determine, and it would be it'd be great to hear what other people have to say. But but you know, we saw that Ringo had a a, a pasty twenty inch uh, medium ride that he was using, you know, on his left. Yep. And um, uh, and then he had another twenty, and he had his uh, an eighteen uh, that that we believe were Zildjian's and his mm. high hats. Um, big question there. We're not certain about the top. I think it was Zildjian, but the bottom was a pasty sound edge. And wow. uh, it's like, wow. And and, um, <laughs> and 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 Ringo, you know, he's got a, an original pair of hi hats that he used during the during the his career with the Beatles. And and he says, you know, he goes, these are the ones that I used on all the records. But it do, it it doesn't um, seem to to uh, uh, be the case, you know? And, um, yeah. So well, you've said before on, on your previous episode of the podcast, which was awesome, um, that Ringo's not an absolute gear nut, like knowing every single piece of yeah. everything and the serial number is obviously like you are. And, and like m- many of the listeners are, um, so it makes sense that he's like, yeah, I think they were, uh, you know, I think it was Zildjian. <laughs> it was actually something different, yeah. but I mean, that's why there's guys like you in the world, you know, to <laughs> which is good just to put the history straight. But it, but that's yeah. still, it's it's I'm I'm still working on that, and I, I plan to you know um, uh, someday get the information out. But the the with with the symbols that it's like the the more evidence I find, or the more clear photographs, and and you can get a timeline, you know, with, yep. with, with them. It's it's just like. There's another one. He goes, where'd this one come from? You know, so there, there was, there was way more than, you know, when, when people were originally saying Ringo just used all Zildjian's with 2018 and 14 inch hats, maybe 15s, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, be- he likes to experiment. I mean, then, and, and I'm sure people like, you don't think like when you're in the moment, like, oh, I need to keep it easy and, and straight for history's sake. And I'm sure someone was like, Hey, throw this one on. He goes, Oh, I like that. And then he tries mm-hmm. it and he plays it. Oh, let's just leave it on. Sure. Um, and I'm on your website. I'm kind of looking down here at my phone because I'm on your, your website, which is, um, R- Ringo's beetle kits.com, which I'll, I'll share in the description and everything. Um, but you've got a really cool page about that. And, and even just down to his, like, um, his, his throne, I mean, I, like having the backrest and things like that. And I believe you said it's, um, he said he used a few, a few different stools, um, but but you don't really think of seats having backrests that early. I mean, I don't, but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. But actually, there was with the research that I uh, that I did, and so so. Ring, but Ringo had used. He took one of his stools, and he had someone make a, uh, you know, I, I guess a handmade um, uh, backrest. Hmm. And um, uh, yet, in the when you watch the movie, you'll see that one. And then there is another one he's using that has like a like a I don't know like a silvery blue um, cushion and and uh, on the seat and backrest. Yeah, and that's that's um, you can't find them. It, it it was manufactured by a company called Beverly Drums in the UK. Sure. And uh, but really looking for one, it, it's going to be extremely hard now because everybody's going to do it if, if they're watching yeah. this podcast. <laughs> so. Yeah, and thrones get a lot of use. And they like they like I mean deterior deteriorate pretty much. I mean if you sit on it and it's had a, a butt sitting on it for uh, fifty or sixty years almost, it's like you know they they don't. That's one thing that that will go. Um, so I mentioned the stickers before on his toms. I'm sure a lot of people watching it were going you know like oh what what was that? And they try and figure yeah. out what it was. It, I, correct me if I'm wrong. It's it's for uh, Drum City, right? What's the story with that? Um. It was just it was just a label that, that they would put on uh, gear, and um, when when they when they delivered that one to Ringo, it seems like they were a little bold, you know, just <laughs> yeah. you know p- putting it on there, and um, uh, you know he he just he just left them, but but it did say you know it was just Drum City with their little logo, which was I think like four circles, mm-hmm. and um, and then they were dressed at the bottom. And, wow! Uh, yeah, and then that—that's—that's that's what that was. That Ringo took him off at, or somebody took him off at some point. They're not on his drum kit now. But. Wow! But not 
until it was filmed for however many 60 hours of footage or whatever. You're right. That is kind of bold to be like, you know, let's just put a sticker on here on Ringo on the biggest drummer in the world's drum set for a little extra publicity. Uh, Andy Dwyer in Liverpool at ADC Drums. He told me that he was sending me some stuff and he was like, you know, a little bit of info there. Um, so uh, where are those drums today? I know. I mean, they're they have to still be in existence, right? Oh, yeah. Ringo has them. Uh, oh, wow. We documented them, you know, archived them. Uh, we had to do a lot of repair work to them, um, but he he has them. You know, we we had um, uh, road cases made, so yeah, uh, all of his kits that he still has, they're they're in a um, climate controlled, very secure um, vault, <laughs> and um, uh, that's where they are. But they're coming out of uh, they're coming out of the vault, and um, uh, here's some news, breaking news: the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is going to be doing a, a complimentary exhibit uh, called "Get Back, Let It Be." Hmm. I don't know all of what's going to be on display, um, but Ringo is loaning uh, his maple kit uh, to the museum, and and also. Um, his red rain jacket that he wore on the rooftop and, and wow. his, his pants. So, um, cool. Yeah. So that's going to be happening. And, uh, so I'll, I'll be obviously going there to, um, set the kid up. Wow. Well, I just had Mandy Smith, who's the education director at the rock hall on, um, a couple weeks ago. And, uh, we were just talking about trying to link up with something. So maybe I can do something where, uh, once it's all up and live, because I'm I'm four hours away from there um, to go and check it out and uh, maybe shoot some video of it for the podcast or something like that, because um, that sounds unbelievable. And it's the perfect place to put it. Um, these are literally almost just priceless pieces of, you know, they're almost art at this point to, to look at his drum set yeah. uh, and see what what was happening with it. Um that's awesome. You you hear you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, I just got. Uh, I, I knew this was going to happen, but yesterday I got the call saying that um, uh, giving timelines and things. So that's, that's great. Be, uh, yeah, that'll be great. And, and the good thing too about it being at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is, you know, the people that I've gotten to know there. I mean, that they, they they all love their job. They're really into it. You know, they have yeah. in depth knowledge. And and as far as the facility, you know, the the um, uh, it's extremely secure, you know, even down to the lighting, you know, it, it comes down to um, uh, uh, like you being UV protectant, you know, sure. so you wouldn't be damaging the uh, um, uh, say, say, like, you know, like deteriorating the color of the drum heads or, or, or skins or, or, or yeah. excuse, the shells, you know, by uh, being in direct sunlight or, or fluorescent light. So, yeah everyone's yeah. got that drum set that's in the corner that's like by a window and the floor half the floor tom has been in the sun for 10 years and it's a completely <laughs> different color uh no it's the perfect place and i remember mandy uh smith was saying that uh they have uh every day 365 days of the year there's security there protecting everything christmas day someone is there walking around um mm -hmm. keeping everything safe so that's awesome now uh, a couple other things, and then we'll get to questions because I want to leave time for that because we have a whole lot of questions um, from from listeners and folks on social media. But um, there's also there's other things that came out with the documentary, such as kind of the there's like a new release of, you know, the Get Back album, which I've listened to. And it's awesome. It's more it's multiple takes of things. And then there's also a film. The Rooftop uh, film is released on IMAX. Is that right? Correct, which is I sold out. I looked immediately, and it was just every date was sold out here in, in Cincinnati. Yeah, and, and I haven't seen it, but everybody that um, uh, that I know has has been rubbing me the wrong way by saying, <laughs> "Hey, I saw it," you know. But everybody says it's mind blowing. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. It's it's um, uh, it's so neat that all this is coming out now, and uh, I think it's you know. It's it's all on Disney Plus or Disney, you know, whatever for people who who want to watch it. Um, and those are obviously in theaters, and you can find it on Spotify. But uh, it makes sense that that I'm sure this is a pretty big financial. Uh, I'm sure Disney coughed up some big dough to be able to get this and yeah. release it, which makes perfect sense. 
Yeah. 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 All right, Gary, why don't I read some questions to you? Is there any other things that you before we do that, that that you think is important to mention about um, about this? I remember one thing. I I watched it twice, the whole thing through twice, which uh, was after that. I was like, okay, I got to take a break and watch uh, something else (laughs) because that's like, you know, whatever, 15 hours. But um, so I I just saw some some neat things again, even in the studio. So just watching how. Like even now, it's 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 interesting to to see how just doing these these tracks live is almost a foreign concept now for the most part, where we live in the multi-track world of do drums, do this. Some of these songs, which are the most classic songs, rock and roll songs in the world, were all recorded at obviously they did they did some overdubs, but the goal was to not do overdubs. Mm-hmm. Um and they got such a great sound. I mean, it's I just know, it's unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And and it's funny that you know, um, I don't know how it is for, for most people, but for me, it's, it's since I was a kid, you know, it, 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 whenever I hear songs, I, the, the drums always seem to be more prominent because maybe that's what I'm really trying to listen to, you know, un, unknowingly at the time, mm-hmm. but I'm cognizant of it now. But but it's just amazing when you listen to uh, to Ringo and then um, and, you know, all this stuff is is live the way it's going down. And it's like, you know, you could focus just on the hi hat and it's like flawless you know yeah. and, and 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 the same thing when, when he's doing you know some fills and things it's just like god it just it just flows you know so i mean that yeah. just just, just mind-blowing and the same with the guitars the vocals i mean they had it all it was just absolutely amazing yeah and, and exactly what you're saying but like the hi-hat has to be perfect but the piano also has to be perfect at the same time and the bass has to it's like if one guy's off, I mean, obviously you can you can maybe punch in some bass or something, but again, trying not to. Everyone had to be on, and these this wasn't a thing where they had been rehearsing it. Like if it's a band's first album, you can write those songs for ten years and then uh, come in and record them. And you know, we've been practicing forever. We really got to see how everything, uh, how the sausage was made, as they say, and um, and they picked it up fast. Uh, I love two of us. That's that's kind of a. I just liked seeing those songs where it started with kind of a different you, you'd hear the different where it's almost like it, it kind of messes with your brain to hear them play it a different way that you've yeah. never heard. But it's a song that you you love. Um, it's just you kind of think what could have been if they went this way and they did it with a, a two four beat instead of the, the you know, the four on the floor kick. It's just uh, it's really neat to 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 see that. Do, does, does Ringo have any feelings about um, he maybe he hasn't talked to you about it, but wanting to do wanting to pick takes on a different track that like oh i liked the drums better this way but we actually went with this way or was he just pretty easy going about it all yeah he did yeah he, to him he's just he's just kind of just just quiet about it from from <laughs> from how his relationship is with 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 me sure, and, um, sure. i never i never push or force <laughs> you know like hey you're gonna tell me this whether you like it or not but, um <laughs> yeah but yeah, but but it is, it's just amazing, and and it's funny too because you know how they just said that they had that chemistry. You know, Ringo would say like, you know, if if they were doing something, Ringo said he goes, we would just know where he goes, I would know where John's going, and and, yeah. and, it, and it just happened. You know, yeah. so so that's all part of the magic. You know, and and everything. Yeah. You know, once again, when when you think about them from the humble beginnings and all of the things that shouldn't have went their way that that did i mean it was always you know one little piece of the puzzle like if that didn't happen something else wouldn't have happened but there was like a it's it really seemed to be a, a guiding hand you know mm. uh, to make them uh what they became and it's just amazing yeah. you know to have decades go by and uh, you know like and, and i guess if you really kind of watched you know like there's been some peaks and valleys but but it's it's but it just keeps carrying on to the to the next generation, and and it just says so much. I want to say a couple, so a couple studio things that I noticed too. I think it was when they moved back into the Apple, you know, in the basement there at their um, office, which was neat to see them building that studio up. I mean, that alone was cool, and I love the like the green carpet and stuff. It's so Apple. just cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But um. And I might be getting my my studios mixed up, which when they were back in the the t- more of the TV studio, but they had the microphones for you know John and George and Paul, where those long like the stands would be coming out of the ground, and they'd have to like tighten them. I mean, what an interesting! I've never seen those 
uh, those type of mics with the stands. I'm sure they're super nice Neumann or something like that. Mm-hmm. But um, do you know anything about those no, mics I, and stands? I, I know nothing about those. <laughs> yeah, which I did, but no. Yeah, pretty pretty interesting technology. But per usual, even today, where things kind of loosen themselves, you could see the Beatles wrestling with their. Let me just get this over here. <laughs> and I also liked how they had. It looked like at one point reversible panels on the walls that could be yeah. reflective or padded like soft yeah. that was neat yeah yeah that was different never saw that before no no which you know these kinds of things you take for granted that like there's there's so many details i love too that i mean you're the you're ringo's like historian you're a beatles nut just like all of us and you're you're seeing stuff for the first time it's oh, it yeah. adds to the mystery yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, it's also amazing, too, when, when you saw them at, at, at Apple and they're recording that, you know, their amps are out. I mean, they're, they're in a relatively small room, you know, and yet, you know, the isolation sounds good, you know, like with, with what you hear now is, you know, in the final product. And it's just it's just it's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it kind of uh, makes I mean, I'm I work I've worked as an audio engineer at studios for years now, and it makes you think like, all right you know, take it back a little bit and look at it like they could do it. Obviously, they're the Beatles, but they could do it. Guys like that could record with however many tracks, eight or 16 tracks. And uh, and there's not that many post-production. There's not many plugins put on. It's really getting it a good sound at the front end, at the source, get the get it set up right. And they're using tape too, which it's just which which Alan Parsons was a tape operator. Is that correct? I believe so. Right? Yeah. Man, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, you know what else you made me think of is uh, you know when uh, when you when they were doing uh, Get Back, and you see Lennon, you know when when they're when they're doing the intro, like instead of strumming, he's just like he's just hitting the the, the string. Yeah. And I'm going Absolutely. Like, Wow, <laughs> you know, so it just, but it's just so creative, you know. It's just, yeah. uh, I don't know if that's something that guitarists do, but I, I've never really seen that before. No. So, no. I loved how it would say, "This is the track that appeared on on the final." Like it started, I think, in part three, you started to kind of see like like this is the one that appeared on the final, or when they went on the rooftop, there were certain tracks uh, where it was like, "This is the one that appears on the album," and and it just kind of was like. Uh, that gave me like a sense of like, oh, this is where it's all going. Because at certain points, it really like emotionally in the middle of it kind of made you feel lost a little bit. Like, yeah. like is this ever going to get done? And <laughs> last, last question, and then we'll we'll move to some of these some of these listener questions. But how did you feel really getting to see the? And, and obviously, you said with um, with John, there might have been some drug stuff going on, but. I mean, the Yoko Ono, which I mean, she's a fine, she's a nice person. Everything's fine. I everyone has their own opinions about that. But that definitely was an interesting uh, part of it to see Yoko and John be so close and then how that affected the other three guys. What did what are your thoughts on that? How did that make you feel watching that? Well, it's funny growing up with, you know, hearing it from from the get go. You know, I mean, Yoko was so hated and and you, and you just you know, at that time, because of limited um, uh, media, you know, it was, it was just either what you saw in the paper or a magazine and, and, and you know, seeing the movie itself and, and you're just reading articles. Right. You know, so so that just starts what everybody, you know, starts taking his truth and talking about. But I think now, you know, you're just looking at it in the rearview mirror and seeing the video or the, the movie. And it, it's like, um Okay, I mean, it, it was different because it was just the four of them. Now there's five of them, but you know, um, I, I think individually, you know, even though they may not have liked it, they they got it, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, he really loves her, you know. So, yeah. and and only they would know John, you know, as well as they do to know, you know, if, uh, you know how they felt about the relationship, being happy for him, but. Um, yeah, Yoko was, was a big influence. And, and I think that just added to the tension of things are really changing now. You know, it's not just because of Brian Epstein being gone and all, you know, all the things that we talked about that you problems you have in a band, but yeah, I think there was just so many, so many pieces to that puzzle that that was obviously one of them, but I don't think it was, it was as, as big as, um, 
it was made out to be. Yeah, and and uh, with those situations, I mean, everyone's had a buddy growing up who who gets a girlfriend, and then there goes my buddy. He's going to now well, hang yeah, out with his. It girl. happened, yeah, and, and I, I have too. Lost the guy completely. It's like whoa, you know. So, but that's yeah. That's- but no one's holding a gun to these people to to our friends or to John Lennon's head. He loved her very, very much, and he made the decision that this is the way I'm going to go, and I want. I'd rather. I've been with you guys for you know with with really since his most of his life yeah. uh, if you go back to like you know liverpool and it it he made a choice obviously for us beatles fans we we wish it would have gone the other way and they would have stayed together forever and then what would have happened but uh it is what it is and it was just interesting and again really sort of uncomfortable to watch it at some points where you think like gosh john you don't realize that you're making everyone else feel a little weird with this <laughs> but it's he's a grown man and he made the choice. Um, so it is what it is. But um, OK, so I'm going to read off a couple questions. There's there's a ton of them. So I hope I get to everyone and um, I will. It might be a little clunky. I'll clean it up. Um, I am going to just read some of these and let's see what we we have. So I'm kind of I'm going to try and consolidate. I've looked through them, but there's a lot of them. Um, all right. So. Here is one from Glenn Kochi. We'll start with a big one here. So from Wilco, he said, what exactly was the small crash slash large splash off to his far right in a few scenes? Yeah, um, it was just a small uh, um, 10 inch crash. Eight or 10. I forget now. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> the mystery yeah. continues. Yeah, but, but uh, Ringo did use that. Um, uh, you'll hear it at the one minute mark. Uh in the song, um, here comes the sun. So yep. that's, that, that's, that's, that's that. Okay. And then, um, he asked, and I'm kind of looking back cause I want to actually look at the uh, photos as well. He said, what was, uh, the rectangular hi-hat jingle attachment? Okay. Yeah, that was, um, uh, I think I have it on my website now. Um, but it was just like a tambourine bar. And then the interesting thing is in the little advert that you see for this item, you could put it on your hi-hat. You could um, mount it on your uh, uh, the post for your uh, uh, kick drum pedal. Hmm. And you had a little stick that you or, or a metal bar you could put through it so you could just shake it with your hand. So it was like three uses. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, huh. so, so that, that's that's what that was. The kick drum beater. I can't believe that. That seems like it would, uh, I don't know, get in the way a little bit. It's, yeah, but but you see all these little sketches of it, and it's just, yeah, it was interesting. That, that's funny. And then uh, Glenn's last kind of thing about, um, uh, he, so he said, I'm assuming those were Ludwig telescoping brushes, but what sticks and mallets was he uh, using during this time? Uh, that, I don't know. He doesn't, he doesn't know, so... Um, interesting. Just some, sti- some sticks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, but he did have some that I found, um, uh, going through some unexpected cases, you know, pl- in places it's like, where'd this come from? You know? And it's like, Oh my God, you know, th- this, this is like, this is 60 stuff. So it must be, but, but he had, um, premier, uh, and Ludwig. Uh, as far as okay. brushes and as far as sticks, I don't know. But size wise, too, the, the ones that he was using there looked to be a little thicker than uh, what he uses now. Now it's like five A's, but it looks like they hmm. could have been two B's or something. So I don't know. Interesting. Wow, that's big. Um, OK, thank you to Glenn Kochi for that. And then uh, just a couple comments, too. There's a ton of questions, but uh, Pocket, uh, Igor Sempeo, I hope I pronounced it right, said Pocket, timing and great taste. That is Ringo. There's a nice yeah. comment. Yeah. Um, Kiri May uh, said he is the most professional musician in the band. I think that's a fair point, but he he also just he stayed out of the drama. That's just Ringo. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean he just he just stayed out of it. Um, okay, so then um, let's see here. Adam Stachelek, uh said um, he never hears him flub apart. He is the rock. How did he always know what to play? Which you kind of touched on before, but that's a fair question, though. I guess that's just his natural ability and his his experience. Yeah, just just to get from God. Yeah, um, I know his anecdote about never play a fill while they are singing. Right. Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, 
And uh, I just, so you just touched on it. I guess it's just a gift from God. That's that's a great way to put it. Thank you, Adam. Um, uh, Ron Danette said, Ringo defines calm. He wasn't just the drummer. He was balanced where it was needed and a catalyst to get new ideas going. Mm, good point. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. Okay. Um, Glenn Johns and his recording techniques. Any information about that? I mean, he he was a monster re- engineer with with a ton of great oh, yeah. uh, credits to his name. Yeah. Well, all I know is he, you know, he, he got a great sound out of out of Ringo's drums. I mean, he, he just sounded so unique, you know. And um, yeah. Um, what's what's amazing about Ringo, and I think we touched on this before, was just that you know whenever whenever you have some naysayers, you know, it's like well. <laughs> Pick a song with percussion in it that the Beatles had done, and what sucked? What, what would you do different to yeah. make that song better? And and there's there's um, there's crickets. You know? Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, he he. What, everything he played um, perfectly, and it fit the fit. It fit it very well. Um, so Mike Curran asked, "Who set up the drums?" Now, was that uh, what was his last name? Was it Mal? Uh, Evans. Evans, yeah, who yeah. who was an who very very nice and, and interesting fellow who had a very uh, untimely end to his life, yes. which was very sad. Which I, I don't want to go into the grim details. People can detail uh, can Google it, but um, so that you know, so he was their roadie. I mean, I guess he just got used to setting up Ringo's gear, knew the way he liked it, and then Ringo like like classic like everyone just tweeted. Yeah, yeah, that 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 seems to be the the the. the um logical answer and you know just from photos that you see i mean he always seemed to be the guy you know that that did it and i'm sure there was tweaking in the studio obviously with mics and you know moving things around but um yeah but mal overall was the guy there is a lot of questions that you've already directed but i want to just kind of just so people know that i see their questions that about how much did paul direct ringo what to play did it bug ringo um, all those things, which you've already addressed that as no, he, I feel like he, he was okay with it. And, uh, he was the right drummer for the, for the gig. Right. Yeah. 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 He just accepted the, you know, um, uh, advice or, or the ideas and, um, and ran with them. Yeah. Uh, Cinco 99 said, how did he tune his drums dampening? We all see, but his tuning thoughts, uh, would be great, which is a good question. What, what's did, did, did Ringo tune them or did Mal tune them or how did that work? Yeah. Well, Ringo had a big part in it. Obviously he's sitting behind the kit and you know, you're listening to the guy in the control room. So, but, but the Beatles are always looking for different sounds and that's why, you know, Ringo always had his go-to drum, you know, uh, four piece set, you know, starting with that one. So you can, yeah. you can hear early on, you know, that, that, that some of the, the, the drums were tuned higher, you know, and then as time went on, they, they started getting deeper and sure. um, then dead <laughs> so yeah yeah but, but yeah. yeah the um the the tea towels um kind of have that that ability to like uh i don't know like like wash away any any like tuning sins if you know what i mean where it kind mm-hmm. of it kind of blends it all together but you still need to have it in the right neighborhood and, and but you know what's interesting too is is with that you, you can go, you can really go down a rabbit hole because um uh, the tea towel, you know, it, it depends on uh, the, the the thickness of the material. You know, you could you could take it. You know, because sometimes Ringo would not just fold it or, or just lie it over. Sometimes he would fold it and just have it off to the side. Sure. You know, so, so you get different sounds, and once again, depending on how you have the drums tuned, you know. And at that time, they were taking bottom heads off. You know, he had the bottom head off his floor tom, and uh, from what I understand, too, with with some of the songs. Um, even though there is no photographic proof as of this point, um, the, the, the bottom heads on the, the toms were sometimes taken off and just and Mike from the bottom. So yeah, all kinds of ways to get um, unique sounds. Yeah. You know, they didn't show much of that experimentation phase, which you kind of might do at home or, you know, I guess that might be boring. I mean, this is a it's a major film release. So to show let's take the bottom head off, you know, to go all the way around. I guess they wouldn't show that stuff. But there had to be the experimenting of 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 doing that and tweaking the sounds and and all that stuff, um, which is kind of a cool thing 
to think about them doing. Let's try it with no bottom heads. Let's try it with bottom heads. Uh, that that takes time. Yeah, and you know, you know, it's interesting to touch on that. Um, when you think of um, uh, that drum fill in in uh, uh, with a little help from my friends, you know, that boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Boom, 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 okay. Um, there's a, the, Ringo actually had his uh, the the floor tom. That's what he starts with. And, and, and the way it's mic'd from the top and you hear that hollow sound of the floor tom. And when he goes to the rack tom, the, the nine by 13, it's tuned real low. So you get that boom. Yeah. And, but yet when you listen to it as a right-handed drummer, you would think, okay, he's got to be going from the tom to the floor tom. But for him, because he, it was easy for him to, to naturally go floor tom up, they, somebody came up with the idea of like, well, then why don't we tune them that way so that it's higher, lower, hmm. but the, but the floor Tom has such a unique sound. And, and, and another time you really hear that sound is at the very end of his drum solo on the end, when it's like, boom, 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 you know, you hear that hollow uh, punch. And um, uh, it, to, to me, it was just so creative. And, and that was one of the, that's one of the things that um, people don't know <laughs> that, are, that are trying to replicate his sound. So there's yeah. one. Well, well. Yeah. And God, I mean, I, I think of recording in studios and like, you know, three hours have gone by and I've just got the drum mic set up and I've, <laughs> I've you know, experimented a little bit and they're doing so much in such a short amount of time and then they turn it around and then they release it and it's and it's they're on to the next one. And then they're they've, they're writing these. It's 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 like they just are masters of using time to its fullest. Um, but when you watch the documentary, there was definitely plenty of downtime and sitting around. And, and but what I would love to and we'll get back to the question, a few more of the questions, because I want to be, you know, make sure you, you get out of here on time. But um, like, I'd love to see this exact same style documentary on one of the earlier albums where they don't have all this history you know, again, I'm not saying anything negative about anyone, but maybe Yoko's not there with John. John's not doing maybe what he's doing with uh, drug stuff, but it would be so cool to see him in their prime with yeah. this level of camera work and stuff. Yeah. You know what else is amazing when you think about it? Um, you, you can really see how George Martin had to play a masterful part, not only with his, his talents that, that he has, but but through the whole process, now you're seeing the Beatles you know, at, uh, at the, the end of their career, but, but now they're masters at, at, in the recording studio. And as we alluded to, it's like not talking about music structure, but just like slang of like move that bit and do this and do that. And jo but George had to, had the mind of, of an education, uh, of, of what music, uh, is and, 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 and yeah. how to explain it to professionals, but he has to take their rudimentary thoughts digest them and then say, okay, I, I, I know what you're looking for. I mean, it's yeah. mind blowing. Yeah, really. I mean, you, but, but the, the quick hand of like, or the shorthand of, of let's do this, 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 it keeps it moving. And then you need the guy to kind of filter it out. Like you're saying, um, which I thought, you know, George Martin didn't have as much, he wasn't as heavily, uh, maybe it's because this is overdubbed and there weren't, or it's, it's less overdubs in this and there weren't as many, you know, crazy string parts and things. Um, but I, you didn't see him around as much as maybe I originally thought he would be in this. Like he was obviously there and included, but I thought originally, maybe it was kind of the early days of the early albums that he would be literally holding their hands through things and kind of working with them a lot, but they really were, like you're saying, I think at this point in their career were masters and could do it on their own yeah. and, and really controlled everything. Yeah. So, you know, that, you know, there was just so many parts were just so, so interesting, but yeah, George yeah. Martin, I think he was, I think he was very frustrated with the way uh, let it be was handled. I, yeah. Cause it was a little loosey goosey. Um, and I got to mention, I, I should have done this before, but Billy Preston, oh. oh my God, when he came in, there was just this like release. There was like a lift, an emotional, like like the weight of watching that and this struggle of like, you know, our favorite band. And then he came in, it was just smiling and just nailing everything. It was such a relief to see yeah. him in there. And and he was he was an integral part. He was re he was needed for that. 
you know, yeah. he, he was he was needed to make that 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 work. You know, especially with with the plan that they had of, you know, wanting to keep things minimal. You know, and uh, yeah, he's just just an amazing talent. Yeah, pick it up right away. You could tell he's got a background in a studio and all this stuff. Um, but all right, a few more questions because I, I uh, uh, let's see. Um, John L. Morganov, Morganov said, unrelated to get back, but it's an interesting question. Uh, ask Gary if there's any ongoing searching for Ringo's premier root beer kit. Uh, um, with that one, things have been quiet on the radar front, but um, but occasionally I'll I'll get notified and then every time i do i'll i'll vigorously go after you know trying to get information photos and things but yeah um, it, it really appears that that it's just gone to history yeah yeah We've been on going into a lot of stories and details but yeah but but i if it's out there man i it, it, would, it would be such a great find yeah yeah um all right a few more uh leave on uh leave on Zivon said, "Miking techniques!" Exclamation point. Well, with that one, you can get a you can get a lot of the uh, dead on information by going to the uh, recording the Beatles book. You know, okay. um, uh, uh, it's it, it just it has photos. You know, showing the uh, how how the drums were set up, but sure uh, and, and mic'd. But um, without going into a much granular detail, you know, at, at the beginning, it was just like an overhead and then one for the kick drum, you know, and the kick yeah. drum seemed to be buried, you know, in the, in the mix. Yep. But then after that, um, uh, you know, they started getting more involved in, in, in the details. And so uh, the, the toms, uh, uh, or the tom would be mic'd underneath, the, the floor tom would be mic'd uh, from the, uh, the side kick drum, you know, in front or inside and uh, snare from the bottom uh, high hats would be mic'd and then um, over an overhead. So yep. that was pretty much the setup, which is getting more into the modern world where you typically will do like uh, you'll have that a snare top, a snare bottom, a hi hat, a kick in, a kick mm -hmm. out, which is very, very modern. And you hear it in this. Uh, you hear that that very clear. Um, I don't know. You get more clarity that way. Um, so, you know, you know, it's interesting to mention, Bart, is that you know um, uh, that when the Beatles first went into EMI, everything was so. Um, it, it was like a, a lab, right? I mean, you had the the workers wearing like the white lab, coats. and they yeah. had, they had their book of. Um, Okay, if you're using this mic, you know, uh, in, in in this situation, it must be eight inches from you know uh, the instrument, and 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 the the Beatles started breaking all those rules, and it's just like, hey, what if we just stuck the you know the uh, uh, the microphone inside the drum? You know, it's like, whoa, you know, it's like you can't do that. I hope nobody's looking, you know, but yeah, but they they did it, and and so even on that level, they were breaking all kinds of ground. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, you, you think we'll just do it, you know, but, but really there's other people are paying. I feel like there's like, um, that's even more of the, like, they're the little kids running around being sneaky, uh, <laughs> but you know, move the mic here. And, and really though, these, these, these engineers had bosses who are recording other, you know, more classical kind of things. And, and it was unheard of to do that. So it's, mm -hmm. that's a great point. Um, Okay, let me see here. One, let's pick one more good one. Um, we've covered a lot of them. Someone here said, I believe, Jamie Stroh Hero. Sorry, Jamie, if I mis mispronounce your name. Um, this is interesting because he, we know him for his tea towels and everything. Did those drums have any internal muffling? Um, his bass drum, you know, later on, it was it was a, a pillow or. A, um, uh, blanket inside, but, but he would use those, you know, on, on, once again, with the bass drum, the, the, the f uh, felt strip, you know, that, that, um, would go from top to bottom or side to side, but yeah. the, that was basically, that was basically it. Nothing else on the other drums. Gotcha. So okay. And now tape sometimes tape. Yeah. That makes sense. We've all done that. Some gaff tape, you flag mm -hmm. the tape a little bit. Um, all right, now last question, and then we'll wrap up here, but, uh, Jeremy plays drums said, uh, this is this is kind of what we talked about before, which is very, I guess you could say granular. 
uh, granular. There was a scene where someone kept switching out his throne, which is very cool to see. Um, was Ringo not happy with the throne he was originally given, or was there a product rep having him try out a new throne? Uh, and we kind of already talked about this, but I just think it's cool that someone else is noticing this. Mm-hmm. He said, either way, I was glad they kept that part in because, man, his first throne looked like a real cheek buster, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if you ever sat on one of those premier uh, thrones, but they're they're so uncomfortable. I mean, it's just hard plastic and it's, there's just no cushion. And um, uh, so, yeah. So when he went to something, even with a little bit of foam, <laughs> it had to be a relief. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because uh, you do see that. And I'm sure I don't I didn't get the vibe that it was a rep from a brand saying, hey, let Ringo try this out now. It seemed yeah. like it was more of like a, you know, oh, you know, this doesn't feel good. Let's switch it out to something else. Um, yeah, because he had a uh, lot of stools there. He, he had like a, a uh, there, there was a premier stool with a f- foamy red cushion, you know, and a white ring uh, around it. You know, he had that, but no backrest. And then, yeah. and then the, uh, the the makeshift one that he had it was it was like his old traditional premier stool model what two forty five and somebody as I said you know made made up a backrest and then and then there was this Beverly uh, 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 stool that that we just alluded to earlier. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I know I said it before, but now very very last question. I'm just kind of discovering some. This is a good one, and then I'll let you go here, Gary. But the Jenkins Martin uh, guys said, "What did Ringo end up doing with his Blaine like Meyer podcast, podcast? Find me on social talks. media at Drug Did they show up on any share, recordings rate, of and his? Leave a review. Yeah, you know, let me know topics enough, that you would Ringo like to learn about in the future. Told, told me this story because we sold time, them at auction in 2015, and um, you know he's he's you know I I, t- I talked to. Uh, uh, a number of people that were in uh, some that were involved with, with George purchasing those for Ringo. And, mm. um, uh, you know, Ringo said that when he got them, you know, he says he had them set up, he tried them and then he just said, um, nah, get rid of them. You know, it was, it was too much, <laughs> but, but th- there are photos now. And one in particular were it, it, uh, it's, it's dated for when they were working on I me mine. And then to the uh, Ringo's left, you know, the, there's like you see three three toms, you know, and they're kind of you know angled. And um, I'm going like, it can't be those Blameyer toms. So I went through photos that I have that, that I took of of them, and 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 I'm matching it up. And so mm-hmm. it's my strong belief that that uh, when you here, I mean, mine when he's doing those little like drum fills in there, you know, uh, but everyone's leaving it. No one, you know, the, yeah. he's using those. Wow. So, um, I, and I, I could be wrong, but I, but I would say that I'm 98% right in that one. And, and I've yeah. seen, and I've seen a, another photo of Ringo uh, post Beatles where he's, he's got some of the larger blame layer times on his right side. So, mm. um, he, he might have forgotten, but but he definitely uh, definitely used them. Mm, man, fascinating. Those are a uh, great answer. Thank you to everyone for asking these questions. If uh, if I didn't read your particular question, it's kind of because either Gary already alluded to it in the in the episode or someone else kind of asked it. But uh, thank you to everyone who submitted those. That's a lot of fun to do. And um, you're a popular guy, Gary. Everyone really likes you and appreciates everything you do for the Ringo community. I mean, you are very, very, very well respected. And um, um, I want to give a quick shout out. I believe I said him before, but I think I'm trying to remember people always suggest episodes kind of as I'm thinking about it. And I go, oh, all right, well, I need to write this down. But I, I, uh, Andy Dwyer suggested this episode with you. And then also my buddy, uh, Jason Berthold, Berthold, Jason, or sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Um, but uh, I want to thank those guys for kind of saying, while I was watching, they go, you need to get Gary. <laughs> well, I have a little so, shot, um, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind. But, yeah, um, Andy, I'll be seeing you um, uh, in Liverpool. Uh, the uh, UK drum show is April 2nd and 3rd in, in Liverpool. So I was invited by Ludwig to do some talks uh, there, both on Saturday and Sunday. And, um, and then on uh, once that's over, the following Monday, I'll be doing a talk at the uh, Liverpool Beatles Museum, which is owned by 
uh, Rogue Best, Pete Best's brother. So that should mm. be interesting. And, yeah. Um, and and I, I, I think I have uh, one or two other talks lined up while I'm in town, and I'll, and I'll be in Liverpool for a week. So I'm looking forward to seeing some friends, old and new. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you to everyone for, uh, you know, for doing it and those guys. And Andy's a great quiet guy and always sends me really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, everyone can check out, um, uh, Gary's website, which I'm looking back here just to make sure I get it right. Ringo's beetle kits.com. I'll link to that in the description. Um, and, uh, this has just been awesome. Gary, be sure to keep us updated as the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame exhibit is going to be happening, because I will absolutely go and check it out, make a you know pretty short drive up there, and I'll update everyone else so we can go watch and check it out, and uh, and I'll take some pictures. But yeah, Gary, thank you again. This is a uh, I, I've been bugging you about scheduling this for the last month, um, so I'm, <laughs> I, I appreciate it. 